first and foremost, Neil, what is word of mouth marketing and why is it important? Word of mouth marketing is just other people talking about your product, your service, your company, your brand without you having to pay them or trying to get them to do anything. And they just do it naturally. Great example of this is if you have a new iPhone or AirPods Pro from Apple and you love it or the iPad Pro, whatever Apple device you're buying, you may end up talking to your friend and be like, man, these AirPod Pros are amazing. Cancels noise when I'm walking outside and it, you know, people can't hear the wind. People can't hear the others talking next to me. Like it's just really good. And I don't hear the background noise and I can just focus on the call. You got to check them out and you got to buy them. It's like the best thing since sliced bread. That's the example of someone evangelizing a product and using word of mouth marketing to really grow a company. And if you look at most of the big companies, like Apple and Microsoft and Google. Yes, they spend money on advertising, but a lot of their growth, the majority of it, just comes from word of mouth marketing. So Seth Godin always talks about, uh, he has a book called Purple Cow, right? The reason why it's called Purple Cow is because it just talks about standing out. And there's another book called Lynchpin, which just means becoming indispensable, right? Those two are kind of similar in that the when you create something that's so good, it becomes remarkable and it becomes, um you you probably don't want to throw it away, right? And so Neil, what Neil's getting at initially is he's talking about the product itself, but in the world of marketing too, it's the 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 level of your your offer, right? And sometimes your marketing might be so good that that in itself is remarkable. So when we think about the Harmon Brothers, for example, when they do the Squatty Potty ad, when the unicorn pooping out rainbow ice cream, that generate generated, I believe, over twenty million dollars in sales, and that's remarkable, right? And so you got to think about whenever you're creating an ad, whenever you're creating an offer, whenever you're creating a product, how can you make it remarkable and not just try to cut corners? Because that's what's ultimately going to help you generate word of mouth, right? Something that's really good, so good that they can't ignore you, right? You want to make something like that. That's one way of going about it. But one thing that's practical that's more engineered, I would say, is a lot of people in tech like to use the Dropbox example of like, oh, you know, they created so much word of marketing, you know, the referral program, right? That is a way to do it to an extent. I'm just saying it as as it is a way, but I don't necessarily think it's the most effective thing because after everyone used that example, everyone tried to emulate it, didn't really work out for most people, right? So it's got to be a really good offer. Yeah, the, the Dropbox model was if you want more free storage space, tweet it out, share it, link to it, tell the people about it more users you invite, the more free space you get. That's how they grew to like an eight or 10 or whatever billion dollar company. I think the best way, you know, a lot of people say the best way is to like create amazing product or service. I agree with that, but that's hard to do. And I'm not trying to talk crap, but most people can't create products like Apple. You know, I can't, you know, it's hard to create products like Elon Musk tries to create. But on the flip side, you know what is a really easy way to generate word of mouth marketing? Go find out what people are charging for in your space that everyone is used to paying for. Not some people are used to paying for, but everyone's used to paying for like, you know, the only solutions are paid and figure out how to create a free version of it. Great example of this I did with Uber Suggest. I ended up buying apps to the public. You know, even if you don't create the best product or service out there, if it's free and people don't have to spend a hundred bucks a month or a thousand dollars or whatever it may be, people love free. And you know, Dharma Shah, uh, the co-founder of HubSpot, talks about this in one of his speeches. A lot of people in marketing and business think about freemium. What can you give away for free? And what are the good features that you can end up getting off and then charging for? Well, the problem with that model is, is you're getting off the good stuff that people really want and the free stuff they don't find as much value for. Hence, you're charging for the stuff that's gated off. But... His model that he ran this playbook years and years ago with HubSpot with, with their marketing grader was how can you just end up giving away something for free and then finding something else that you can sell that can make up for everything. So for example, in my business, we give away a lot of software for free that others would charge for because we'll sell consulting services at my ad agency, which make up for a lot of the cost for giving away stuff for free. On the flip side, there was an e-commerce company that was selling toothbrushes and mouth cleaners. And, you know, their whole pitch was, we're going to help you make your mouth smell fresh 24-7. And what they would do is they would say, hey, we're going to give you this tongue cleaner or toothbrush. It was one or the other for free. Just pay for shipping. And people are like, yeah, sounds good. This is a great deal. But the way they would make their money, that was their loss leader. But the way they would make their money is it would sell people on like, mouth solution that makes your mouth more fresh or a specific kind of uh, toothpaste. They'd have all these upsells to make back 
their money for giving away their quote unquote front end for pretty much free. I get they were charged for shipping, which helped recuperate some of their costs as well. But the point I'm getting at is you can give away a lot of stuff for free that can get people in the door. And that creates a ton of word of mouth marketing. And then figure out something more expensive to sell that can help you recuperate all your costs plus more. Yeah. When it comes to word of mouth marketing, I, the, the final thing I'll say is bringing it back to all, like even what Neil is saying too, it's it's just an irresistible offer, right? And so with Answer to Public, Uber suggests, so he's basically giving away free SEO tools, right? Where other people would pay $50, $100 a month plus for, right? That's a damn good offer, right? And so what can you do that's remarkable? You don't necessarily need to create like a, an iPhone or something like that, but you can still create a really good offer. And, you know, we we have our, our friend, you know, Alex Hermosi, who has his book, $100 million offers. It's 99 cents. That in itself is a good offer. And that book is going to teach you how to create good offers, right? And then you can apply it to whatever service or whatever product that you're doing. The final thing I'll say is I think about recently on, on YouTube, you have this guy, uh, Neil, do you know who CoffeeZilla is? No. Okay. So CoffeeZilla is a guy that basically he's like a, like a detective, right? He kind of online detective. He goes around exposing people's like scams and stuff, right? He's like, and then recently he exposed, it was a three-part series where he exposed uh, Logan Paul for like a crypto scam, right? And it was a three-part series. And what I'm saying here is that CoffeeZilla, Newsjack, basically, he took someone's clout, right? And it hit upon a trend. And like that piece of content itself was so remarkable that everyone on the internet is talking about it right now. And even Logan Paul felt the need to do like a one hour, 20 minute podcast on it yesterday and even a seven minute response video. Right. And, and so when you do something like that, it's remarkable. And so I just want you to get, a, to get you to think about offers in different ways here. Like you can even make a different offer, like a nice offer packaged around content. So think about what you can do that's irresistible. And the easiest way to figure that out, to get really good word of mouth marketing is do something that no one else is doing and give away stuff for free that most people have to charge for or really low cost. Amazon did a great job of this too earlier on. Sign up for a Prime membership for, I think it was 99 bucks back in the day. I don't know what it costs right now and get free two-day shipping. And now if you're a Prime member, a lot of times I get free next day shipping, which is kind of crazy. If I order in the morning, sometimes I get it the same day. Did you see the report they did on this? They, they did a report. I, I read this a couple of years ago, but a prime member's LTV or lifetime value is substantially higher than a regular user. And so the, I think they had like a bunch of actuaries. So a bunch of math whizzes um, do this in the beginning because everyone was like, dude, we're going to lose so much money doing this, like the, the the two day shipping thing. And it actually ended up working out because Jeff Bezos thought so long term. So that's what it is. Anything else, Neil? Oh, that's it. We're getting a lot of people saying, hey, I want to get into marketing for next year. Where should I go to learn? And there's a lot of tools, the SCM Rushes, Ahrefs, UberSess, Answer the Public, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of places you can read, Single Grain, NeilPatel.com, Search Engine Land, Backlinko, HubSpot, and the list goes on and on. But there's one thing that you need to focus on if you want to be a better marketer in 2023. You got to experiment and you got to start marketing your own website. The best way to actually improve, it doesn't matter what level of a marketer you're at, is to create your own website and practice on it. If you want to get better at paid ads, run paid ads on your own website. Try to sell something or collect leads. If you want to get better at SEO, try to rank your own website. If you want to get better at CRO, optimize your own website conversion. If you want to get better at email marketing, collect emails, test different copies and subject lines, send them out, see what converts. You got to actually practice. When, when you're not practicing and experimenting and testing different things on your own website, you're not going to be an amazing marketer. That's how you learn marketing. That's the best way. Yep. So in terms of how you can become the ultimate marketer, I'm just going to share a story here. So when I first started learning marketing, I was working a full-time job. It was a dead-end job doing data entry. And I was like 21, 22 years old. And then I had picked up an internship with this company called Human Healthy Vending. Okay. It was a free internship. They actually picked a, co a cohort of 13 of us. They didn't pay us anything. But what they did give us was they gave us all these courses that were worth thousands of dollars, right? In that three-month period, I would basically you know, work at my full-time job from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. I would change my hours to earlier. And then from like 3 p.m. until like midnight, I would just study the hell out of digital marketing. And like, that was nice. And we we did get to implement, you know, build out these websites. And we realized later it was for SEO purposes. <laughs> but my point is that was nice, but it wasn't enough, right? If you are trying to get better, you have to put your hand on the stove. You have to actually experience things for yourself. And you actually have to go experience these trials, right? Because there's no struggle without, vic there's no victory without struggle. And 
what happened was then I ended up, I, I shared a story in the past on this podcast where I built my light show videos website. Right. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I like going to EDM concerts and I like the light shows. I'm going to rank number one for that. And then, you know what I realized two, three months later, I was ranking number one and that keyword didn't have volume. Okay. Lesson learned, right? Like doesn't matter what, like all the things that I read and, and oh, okay. I learned my lesson there. Oh, okay. Let's, let's build this, um, how to get rid of pimples website. Okay. Oh. And then what I did, I, I bought all these, these cheap links from these like black hat forums and then I paid text brokers or whatever for these like 25 to $50 articles. And then all of a sudden the site started getting like thousands of visits a month. I was like, look, I made it. I freaking made it. And then what happened two days later, the site got torched. And so you have to learn, you have to have some trial by fire or else you're really not going to learn. Because if you just keep learning, like by reading things, you're just going to be a professional student. Yep. So go and experiment, try stuff out on your own website. If you don't have one, create one. That's how you become a better marketer in 2023. Yeah. The final thing I'll say too, is that's not to say you could, you, you shouldn't listen to like podcasts like this or check out YouTube or read things. Right. I think it might be, you know, 10 to 20% is, is reading the, the rest of the percentages is maybe doing right. Maybe a little, when you're a little earlier in your career, maybe it's a little higher on that, but you have to keep experimenting. You have to keep doing. And especially when you look at the cost to start up a website or, or, or build an app today, it's a lot cheaper. You can use, you know, tools like Webflow. You can use Squarespace. I mean, you can use chat G or sorry, not chat GPT. You can use, you know, these uh, AI tools to help you build landing pages as well. Right. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. You just have to go out there and do the big thing that I always tell people is experimentation. It used to be where if you create long form articles, you did really well with content marketing. It used to be if you created videos, you do really well because it was novel. It used to be that if you just create a podcast, it'll do well because there wasn't as much competition. Times change. Market conditions change. One strategy doesn't always work forever. But the thing that has helped Eric and I do well with our content marketing is we always experiment. You got to keep trying new things. You got to look at the trends. You got to see what other people are doing that's hot and see if you can take a little bit of that and integrate it within your strategy to see if you can do well. So some of the things that we've seen that are doing well in 2023 are one-off is to actually talk about current trends. So a great example of this, if you look at Billie Jean's Instagram, yes, it's about marketing, it's about business, but he'll talk about things like, Mariah Carey's Christmas song and how much money she made from it and how it's a great business. Or he'll talk about the Netflix series Wednesday and how Netflix has done from that. So he's integrating marketing in everyday life. For example, I went to Target and I filled me with the Target shopping cart and I broke down how they put bigger shopping carts on purpose because that way people don't feel like they bought that much, which allows them to generate more revenue, right? These are examples of real life content that you're integrating within your story that we see doing really, really well in 2023. The other thing Eric and I see do, doing really well this year as well is collaborating with other influencers. Eric's done a little bit about with this with a guy named Chris Stowe, where they'll both post stuff on their social profiles and they both post the same piece of content and add each other to it. So what it does is it's going out to both their audiences, it's giving them more visibility, and it's also helping get more followers and engagement as well. Cool. So I'm going to talk about what I'm planning to do. I think Neil can kind of kind of align with this too, but high level, it's, it's about experimenting, which is a form of just evolving at the end of the day, because you go back 10 plus years or so, both of us were blogging. And then you go back maybe five years or so when my YouTube was actually like, I was getting like 40, 50, 200,000 plus views per video. And when YouTube was a lot easier and like things change, right? And then now like what, what worked well on YouTube a couple of years ago won't work as well because pe people's viewership, like their behaviors change over time too. But what I find working, and I was even looking at my own behavior yesterday, you know, it's, I'm re rec we're recording this in, in the middle of the holidays right now, but what I really enjoy doing during the holidays, is just reading a lot of stuff, but I find myself actually watching more stuff. And on YouTube, I've, I've, my behavior has actually changed more towards watching podcasts, right? Which actually lends well to what we do here because I, this is a podcast. I have another podcast. And now, you know, we're going to be uh, working with uh, Spotify and, and and basically we're going to have access to their the 18 of their podcast studios in LA. Right. And so the way I'm looking at it now is like my behavior is like, I watch podcasts. We do podcasts. Okay. I'm in LA. 
How do we collaborate with more podcasters that have strong reach and also YouTubers that have strong reach? Do it there. It's it's convenient that way. And then also build a community around it, right? So do, those are the buzzwords that I'm kind of paying attention to this year. It's like, okay, use a pillar piece of content, which is for us, it's a podcast, but you have the video, chop it up, remix it, right? Do more collabs with people that have good reach. And then also build a community around it, right? Which we've been doing for the last couple of years. So that's what I'm excited about. It's, I, I think it's, we're seeing a lot of these channels become mature and now it's about the right mix that works for you. So that's the evolution that I'm seeing, Neil. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And it's funny too, like you were talking about YouTube, you know, if you create long form videos on YouTube, that's fine, but YouTube is trying to push hard into the shorts game. So it's like, if you're not creating the content that they want, you're not going to do as well. And it just comes back to, if you want to do well, yeah, you can copy what Eric and I are planning on doing this year, but more so, you need to get your team, yourself, everyone aligned with continually test and experiment and see what's working and double down on what's working and, you know, do less of the stuff that isn't. Yeah. F final thing I'll say from my side is it, Neil kind of uh, brought up a good word team, right? And so a lot of you might be working with contractors right now, or you might have full timers on your content team. It's really important, in my opinion, to align with these people, because whether it's a weekly thing or a biweekly thing, just to talk about what you're seeing and what you would like to see with your content, because they can't read your mind. And so I, I've had to learn that multiple times over the years, right? It, it'd be nice if everyone could read your mind on certain things, but it's really important that you're clear and you say, hey, here's the vision. Here's what I'm seeing this person, you know, X, Y, and Z doing, and I would like to do it this way. And then you can continually iterate, right? And that goes back to the evolution piece. And that goes back to the experimentation piece. There's a few things that you need to keep in mind. I'll go and then Eric, feel free and add whatever you want to add. I know you've done influencer marketing as well. The first thing that I've really seen is if you focus on influencers with follower account versus engagement, you're going to be screwed because if they're not engaging, that means they're probably never going to buy from you. The second thing is if their following isn't 100% related to your products and services, you're going to be screwed. So don't go after the Kardashians. That's always an example I love giving because their follower base is too broad and it's going to cost too much money. You also want to go after micro influencers on that same note. So the more specific the influencers are, the more well-known they are within a space, the better off you are. Then you also want to make sure that when they post about your product or service, they just don't do a promo. They showcase using it, the results, why they like it. They really go in depth. And then when they tell you to go to the website or whatever landing page that they're sending them to, you want to make sure that they're also on your landing page. So it's congruent. So that way they just didn't feel like they're pushing their followers. Don't want to feel like they're just being pawned off to some other company and just being sold all the time. But when the messaging is congruent, it just does way better. So you want to make sure the follower or the influencer, not the follower, the influencer is also on the landing page on your website where they're driving the traffic to, and each influencer should have their own page. You also want to rotate through them. If you use the same influencer for years or even sometimes months, the results aren't always that good. What we found is when you rotate through them, it's much better. And you also want to have a big slew of them, not one or two, not even a hundred. I'm talking about thousands if possible and continue to rotate through them and use all the ones that are profitable, cut the ones that aren't and continually add and try to find more and experiment until you get it right. I'll, I'll keep mine brief. So actually, Neil and I, we have a we have a mutual friend and he actually sold his company for a couple hundred million dollars. And he actually got in on like the Kim Kardashians of the world back when they actually weren't doing much influencer marketing. So you have to you have to buy low, sell high, right? And it actually worked out well for him because it actually was related. It was a beauty brand, right? And so yeah. um so and he bought low and he did sell during the peak of the market too. <laughs> yep. Yeah, both, both. So he timed both really well. And so that is kind of an example of where it's like they were big influencers, but they were kind of like micro because influencer marketing wasn't really a big game at the time, right? So it's all about timing. There are other, there, there's some, there's a handful of tools that I want to call out here. You want to look at engagement. Mighty Scout is one tool that you can use to check out engagement for different accounts. Spark Toro is the, the tool that's created by Rand Fishkin and you can enter in like, you know, marketing influencer or whatever. And you can actually find it. There's like, it actually has pretty good listings of like top podcasts, you know, Twitter profiles. And I show like the engagement rates and all that too. So, you know, I, I think the move there is just to, because it's charged monthly, you just turn it on for a month or so and then turn it off. They probably should charge on like credits or something, but maybe that's another day for like a business model talk. And then I would say too, I, I think it's also understanding how to negotiate, negotiate with people, right? It's also understanding what they want because you're dealing with people at the end of the day. And a lot of these influencers, let's say really big influencers, they're very, they're very money driven at the end of the day, right? Whereas the micro influencers, you might be able to get away with some 
and I, I shouldn't say getting away, you might be able to do a deal with a combination of cash and maybe some other things that they want or that they need that you can kind of provide, right? So it's all always about figuring out what they need and where it's a win-win for both sides and not trying to make the other side feel like they lost. Some years I'm pretty good on my predictions. Some years I'm just way off. Last year on my business predictions, I was one for five. So 20%. <laughs> Hopefully this year is a little different. So I'll start first and then we can kind of bounce around here, Neil. So first and foremost, on the marketing side, this is more business related, but I think it's also marketing related. I think we're going to see more M&A activity in the next, in the next year, but also probably into the, into 2024 as well. And how this relates to marketing is that you can basically scoop up assets, right? So that means maybe let's say you are SEO software, maybe there's some other SEO software that pops up that is more kind of more related to what you're doing. And there's a good audience there. There's a good number of users. There's, you know, they're, they're very, it's a rabid fan base. So there's going to be assets for you to scoop up there, or there are maybe perhaps media companies that you can pick up. So sites that are driving a lot of traffic from SEO, you can go to acquire.com. That's full disclosure. Neil and I put in a little money into, into that company, but you know, that's just like a eBay for like buying companies. The other thing that you're going to end up seeing is more people leveraging short form video. So you see it already on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, the list goes on and on. But when you do a Google search, unless you're clicking on the video tabs, it's very rare that you ever see short form videos. Because so many people are spending their attention on short form videos and more and more people are creating them, search engines like Google and Bing are going to have no choice but to showcase a lot of short form videos, um, which is going to drive a lot more traffic. And because they have data on, let's say, what you do in YouTube and what you like, it's much easier to, to figure out, all right, what should we show you from a discovery perspective when you're performing searches, let's say on Google. So create more short form videos. You're going to see it get a lot more love and a lot more quote unquote evergreen traffic, not as much as blog posts, but um, you'll get a little bit more evergreen traffic than what you're getting right now from your short form videos. Yeah. Another marketing prediction for 2023 is we believe that marketers are going to have some form of AI assistant by the end of the year. So most marketers, let's say 70, 80% or so might be using a tool like chat GPT, or maybe using a tool like Jasper, or you can be using, there's a bunch of Twitter tools out there that, that use AI to help you in terms of writing hooks and, you know, um, coming up with ideas that, you know, from the, the top creators out there. So there's just a lot of different ways to, to work off this. And also like I've, I've seen AI create landing pages too, that look really, really good and AI created art. So I think we're just scraping the surface here, but I, I think we're going to see a lot more usage, a lot more practical utility out of AI in 2023. Yeah. And on our end, another thing that we believe is going to start happening within 2023 is there's because of AI, there's going to just be too much content. There already is a lot of content and people are like, oh, how's Google going to deal with it? Well, if you search for terms like auto insurance in the United States, there's less than 200,000 searches a month, but yet there's over a billion pages of content. So are they used to large quantities of content and them having the difficult choice of picking the best ones? But what you're going to see in 2023 is people will start realizing that, hey, there's already a lot of content. I need to actually focus on updating my content more. If I keep it updated and fresh, more like Wikipedia does, it'll tend to rank much, much, much higher. That's one of the main reasons for their success. All right. Another marketing prediction for 2023, this is again, more, more business related as well, is I believe that full-time hiring is going to slow down quite a bit. And that means more, more room for freelancers to jump in. Now, that's not to say if you're a superstar, full-time hiring ain't going to slow down that much for superstars. But in general, hiring is going to slow down given kind of the, the macro environment that I believe that we're going into. I think the problem with the, my statement right now is like if, if mo like 80 plus percent of people believe we're going into this environment, it's it's usually like the herd. If the herd believes we're going this way, then like, are we really going that way? So anyway, I'm still going to stick with that. I believe that full time hiring is going to slow down in general. Neil? Yeah. And another thing that we believe is going to happen in 2023 is podcasting is going to boom. You're going to see a lot more companies create podcasts and you're going to also see podcast advertising boom. Companies are going to be leveraging podcast advertising, not really to drive sales as much as people would think, but more so to promote their podcast so that way they can get more subscribers and listeners. Um, it's an amazing channel. Think of the blog as being a great channel, right? It's already proven out. A lot of companies have them. Now you should also create a podcast. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason I've been podcasting for almost 10 years and doing this one for almost five years, I believe. And, and we enjoy it. It also kind of, you know, gives us an, an excuse to hang out and also an excuse to talk to interesting people. Now, the other thing I'll say from my side, I have two more, including this one is 
that more companies will try to take control of their marketing because that marketing, because marketing is getting harder in general, you know, the, the reliance on just, you know, ad platforms in the old days, maybe two years ago, I'm not saying ad platforms are completely dead, like the, the metas or the, the, the Googles of the world. They're still great businesses, especially Google. Right. And what, what I mean by this is that we're going to see more people try to say, okay, let's take more control of our marketing. Let's, let's level up our retention marketing. So email SMS, let's level up, you know, the assets that we control, you know, like, like our blog, right? Like maybe it's create more content there. And plus for the content that we're creating, let's figure out a pillar piece of content and let's, let's figure out how to distribute it to short form to Neil's point and also the other channels. For us, it happens to be like one of our pillar pieces of content is this podcast. Then it gets distributed to, to YouTube and then we cut it up into short form content. So I believe we're going to see companies try to take more control of their own marketing, take control of more organic social while also continuing to layer on paid. But I believe the over-reliance of paid is going to continue to come down. So that's it for this episode. There's going to be a lot of different things that change in 2023, but make sure you continue to listen to Marketing School as we'll be updating you on what's happening in marketing and how to adapt to the economic conditions. And also please rate review this podcast. We really appreciate it. When you think about your funnel, it is something that you can absolutely control. And we're going to talk about how you can fix it because if you fix your funnel, you're going to have higher conversion rates, which hopefully means more revenue for you at the end of the day. So if, if you don't know what a marketing funnel is to back up a little bit, someone visits your website, let's say a homepage, then they may go and find a product that they like. So then you got the product page, then they may add it to the cart. So then you got the, you know, cart page, then they decide to check out. And if they purchase, then eventually get a payment page and then a thank you page. That's an example of a funnel. People have to go from step to step to step in order to complete. There could be multiple funnels for one website and a funnel for product pages, service pages. There's literally funnels for all types of websites. The easiest way to figure out what's wrong with your funnel is to look at what are the drop-offs. So in your Google Analytics, you can actually see paths. Where are people going from one page to the next page? What's the drop-off? The bigger the drop-off, Typically, those are the pages that have the most issues. Those are the pages that you want to focus on first to improve. And what you can do is you can run qualitative surveys on those pages to try to figure out what objections people have, what issues they have on why they're not converting. If you then take that data, run A-B tests through Google Optimize or any tool you want, and tweak your copy, tweak your images, answer the objections that people had, what you should see over time is you should see the drop-off rates decreasing and more people completing the overall funnel. Now, there's a big mistake that companies make when they try to improve their funnel. They optimize for reducing the drop-off for each rate, and that's their end metric. That shouldn't be your end metric. The real metric that you should track success is conversions. So even if the drop-off decreases, but it doesn't cause more conversions, it doesn't matter. You need actually, yes, you ideally want the drop-off to decrease, but at the same time, the end result of getting more conversions also needs to increase because if you don't see an increase there, your efforts are being wasted. That's why you need an A-B test and also focus on how many conversion points you're getting at the end. Yep. I'm going to use a real life example in, in this case for YouTube. And so our, our the marketing funnel for YouTube, in, in this case, it's actually just more views, right? At the end of the day, it's sure you can talk about click through rate, you can talk about AVD, which is average view duration. But what really matters is, am I getting more views for the video? And so this is a very simple way of fixing a marketing funnel here, because it's just like, you know, are people seeing the video and then are they actually clicking through and are they viewing, right? So very simplified marketing funnel here. And so what we do for marketing school is we run A-B tests on the thumbnail through a tool called TubeBuddy. And TubeBuddy allows us to run A-B tests here. And the beauty of that is that, you know, for example, in some cases, we'll test like an image of Neil and I combined and then like with an image of a Tesla because we're talking about Tesla, right? And then we might show like a just a Tesla, like we'll show the car in one and we'll show maybe the logo in the other one. And then one might perform you know, 2x better or something like that. And then, you know, test gets the statistical significance and then it automatically just switches to that one, right? And so that, that's an example of testing our marketing funnel. I think too many of us, we kind of take things at face value and then we do one title, one thing, thumbnail and we're done. But when you take it to the extreme and you look at like a Mr. Beast, for example, he'll make, he'll make like five or six thumbnails and you spend like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars just testing the hell out of this stuff. And that's all to just get more views, get a higher click to rate at the end of the day, because let's say you're getting 10 million impressions on a video, if you're getting a 10% click-through rate, well, then at the end of the day, you're getting 1 million uh, views, right? If it's 5%, then you're getting 500K. And so 
this is like, we're talking high level here, but this also applies to your business, right? And so whether you look at a form, you could be running a type form. Type form does a good job of showing you where drop-off is. Google Analytics also does does a good job of showing you where drop-off is. And then you just look at the overall conversions at the end of the day. You can use Google Optimize, whatever tools you want. And the final thing I'll say is you want to be testing your messaging too, right? There's a good tool called, a, or it's called a B2B message testing platform. I'm, I'm looking at it right now from Pep, formerly from CXL or Conversion XL. So you can use that. And then their B2B messaging testing platform. And you can also read April Dunford's book. It's called Obviously Awesome. And she's a master at messaging. So if you want to test, oftentimes messaging is going to help you go a long way. That's a first place to start. And the last thing that we have from our end is Eric mentioned type form. Again, the reason I want to emphasize this is you're not going to really improve your funnel if you don't know what objections people have. And you're not gonna get that by just looking at the numbers like on Google Analytics. Yes, Google Analytics will tell you what pages people have issues on because you can see the drop off, but you need to ask them. Whether it's picking up the phone or emailing them or running a survey like type form or anything like that, getting feedback is a key to improving because then you'll have a list of objections that you need to answer within your copy, within your product page, your checkout page, whatever it may be. Some objections could be like, ah, oh, what about, but wasn't sure. And there was no 30 day money back guarantee or free return policy. So th these are all objections that people may tell you. And if you get enough people saying it, those are the objections that you should focus on first answering throughout your funnel. And that's when you really see major lifts. Here's a question, Neil. I, I, I've used a lot of these tools in the past that will record and then you can see what people are doing on the site, right? From personal experience, that hasn't really moved the needle for me. Um, what about you? If you look at the data and quantity, sure. If you look at recording by recording like one at a time, yeah. it's very rare that you see something that's going to drastically improve your numbers. Exactly. So I think, so what, I, what I'm getting at here is that when you're looking at like a data in aggregate, like a heat mapping tool, for example, so Neil used to have a tool called Crazy Egg. I think you still have it. If, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I'm not sure now. And then there's like tools like, you know, Hotjar out there that will actually do that. And then actually you can record the screen. I've gotten value from the heat maps, but not so much the videos themselves. So your mileage may vary. I'm, we're just kind of speaking from experience right here. Um, but anything else? The, the, the videos, the best purpose for them is actually support. So imagine someone complaining that they're having issues. You can then go watch a video recording to see where they're stuck and if you have bugs and to fix it. That's where the recordings are the most helpful. From a marketing standpoint, not as much, yeah. but from a, yes. a support and yeah. customer experience perspective, it helps a lot. Cool. So at the end of the day, you have to think about this. Who are, when you go to a dinner party or when you go to like a family event or whatever, the people that are most engaging, the people that can hold a crowd, the people that tend to, you know, well, they, they have people that are just engaged the whole time. They have the kids are engaged, the family's engaged. These are the storytellers, right? And when you think about some of the best companies in the world, they are like Disney, for example, right? They're the king of storytellers, right? Because look, look, they have Marvel. I mean, who, who else do they have? They have Marvel. What, who else? Um they have Marvel. They own all the Fox stuff. Yes, all the Fox. Uh, stuff. Uh, they own Pixar as well. Yep. So ton of IP, right? And like it's they're the best storytellers in the world. But even when you go back to Steve Jobs presenting the the iPod and then eventually the iPhone, right? He 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 told he he tells good stories and he brings people on a journey. And so when it comes to marketing. The storytelling is really important. It doesn't matter like how good your product is if you aren't able to bring people on the journey and tell a story that's convincing because once you're able to tell a good story, people are just convinced they're along with you on the journey. You think about the best movies that are out there, they take you on a journey, right? So we want to talk about in this episode how you can go about leveling up your storytelling so you can get more conversions and more traffic. Yeah, and look, the biggest thing that I found through storytelling is people need to go on an emotional roller coaster. If you watch a movie... A movie isn't really, at least a good ones. It's not as just simple as like, here's what's going to happen. And it's very predictable. There's usually a lot of curveballs, things that go unexpected, a lot of ups, a lot of downs. In essence, you got to take people through an emotional roller coaster. Think soap opera. When people go through the ups and downs, they're much more invested and they're much more likely to end up closing into a customer. The other thing that I found with storytelling is people want to be able to relate. If you can end up creating scenarios within your story or characters that people can end up relating to, it ends up doing a lot better than if someone can't ever uh, relate. Great example of this is the old ads that 
Bloomberg ran when he was looking to run for presidency. So in the United States, Michael Bloomberg, the guy who owns Bloomberg, one of the richest people in the world, was trying to run for presidency. He created a lot of commercials that had his life story. No one could relate. He's just like, oh, parents so proud. Young guy starts a company from nothing and then now is a multi-billionaire. Look at all these people he employs and all this money he has. People can relate to that story. And he didn't do really well. He spent a lot of money on TV ads. It literally got flushed down the toilet. Why? Because he was running ads on why he's so successful and rich, which the majority of the people can't relate because how many people are richer than him? Probably less than a few hundred people in this world, right? So you got to make sure that your story is relatable because then people are much more likely to want to you know, stay connected and also become customers. Yeah, your storytelling, that ultimately becomes your message, right? And so, you know, let, let's let's use let, let's think about the stories that are on uh, that are big in kind of politics, right? Like, for example, AOC says like billionaires shouldn't exist, right? Like that's a that's a line that sticks with people, right? Or when Trump won the presidency uh, you know, a, a long time ago, love him or hate him, right? It was this whole like make America great. Right. Versus like when, when Hillary didn't have that, she didn't really have a message to, to go off of. Right. And so that's that's part of the reason why you want, because it's like there's a story, there's a message that you can rally around. It's like, oh, like America is like, you know, not as good as it should be, you know, that type of stuff. Right. So not to talk about politics here, but that's an example of marketing where it, it actually worked. And he he won like the presidency. Right. What I want to do right here is I want to actually give you a framework that you can use. And this is called the Harmon Circle. So. Those of you that are watching on YouTube and should be subscribing to our Marketing School YouTube channel, this is the Harmon Circle. So Dan Harmon Story Circle, right? So this story circle revolves around the Lion King. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen the Lion King. Neil and I certainly have growing up. But Neil, do you, has Emma seen your, your daughter? Has she seen Lion King yet? Uh, she's too small for movies. She's not there yet. Okay, cool. So she will get there. I, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to have her watch it. But if you start yeah. in the red section over here, this is the very beginning, right? So the framework is you need go search, find, get, return, change. And that's a mouthful. You're probably going to have to study this a little more. It's a short podcast. Wait, to, to repeat again, it's you need go search, find, get, return, and change. And Eric, you want to give an example yep. of each of them? Yep. So we're going to break it down. We're going to use the Lion King circle here, right? So again, it's there's eight things that you have to go off of. So number one, if you've seen the Lion King, the whole idea is that Simba, the 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 sun lion, right, the little lion, he is brought to the kingdom of Pride Rock, right? So he's he's born, and then you know the the monkey godfather like you know puts him up, and then everyone's like, oh my god, like this is the next king, right? So that's the very beginning. Now, the need section is he needs to prove himself and become king, right? Because you can't just become king and just inherit it. Like you have to develop certain traits, right? So he's like, okay, there's a certain need. Okay. Then go, he has to leave the kingdom after his father is murdered. So his father, who is the king, Mufasa, he gets killed, you know, trying to save Simba, right? Because Simba's trying to kind of prove himself a little bit. He gets a little too ambitious. And then his father actually gets thrown, you know, and trampled by the wildebeests. That's what they are. And so what happens is Scar, who's his evil uncle, that evil uncle um, line, he wants to become king. And so he ends up pushing Simba out, right? And so, you know, Simba just goes on a journey. He he like, you know, has to leave, you know, the kingdom. And then eventually what happens is he returns to Pride Rock because he understands. So he's he, he goes searching for himself, right? And then he finally understands that he needs to, you know, his job is to become king. So he goes to find, you know, he, he goes on that journey now, right? So he returns to Pride Rock eventually. He has to fight Scar, right? Then what happens is he, he gets what he's, he's looking for. So Scar's casted out, right? And then what happens is he finally moves back up. He becomes king. You know, he saves everyone. And then flash forward, you have Simba, who is now the king. And then, you know, the, the next cub is born, you know, with Nala, his childhood friend. And this whole journey journey completes the whole story but you can see the whole point of explaining this is that you know there's a there's a start to a journey right but there always has to be like a change there has to be like a but right there's a big but that happens and then you get to the very end and then that, that's what happens but if it's just like the whole story is about your, every success after success after success it's not that interesting there has to be like a like a why behind it you know people have to rally behind it and people have to be interested in it and that's what a good story is the final thing i'll say is if you want to learn more about this stuff Google Dan Harmon story circle. And then I'd highly recommend reading the book story worthy, really good book. And that helped me reshape how I think about stories. And in storytelling, think about like the big moments in this story. The two big moments was Simba was born and he is going to potentially be the next King or he should be based on how the story works. 
And the other big one was, yes, he was outcasted. He was gone. But the big one was when he came back, people were shocked and they're like, oh crap, this is Simba. He is the rightful heir to the throne. So those are the big two turning points in the movie. Yeah. The final thing I'll say, so to to add on, I actually made, maybe this is reinforcing your point, Neil, but uh, so the, let me give you the eight points again. So it's you, need, go, search, find, get, return, change. It's actually right in the middle where it's the, the search portion where like you, you go, you search for what you're looking for. And then you actually find that what you're looking for isn't what you wanted. Like what he went to search for, which is like freedom to get away from all that crap is actually not what he wanted. He's like, you know what I really need? I need to become King again. I need to be become the rightful. I'm the rightful heir. I should become King again. So that is it for today. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know what you think in the comments and don't forget to rate, review, subscribe. It helps us grow.